In the dimly lit room, the chilling message scrawled on the wall still haunts those who see it. I will kill again. This is the scene where Byron Carr, a beloved teacher, was brutally slain in his own home, a crime that has remained unsolved for decades. For Byron Carr, family meant everything. He grew up close to his parents, particularly his mother, and he also had a strong bond with his brother John, as they were similar in age. He also had a large social circle and loved to travel. Byron taught English at Montague Regional High School and was quite popular among his students. Some of his previous students remarked that he had a golden heart and would stay in contact with his students even long after his classes were over. In 1988, Byron, then 36 years old, lived in a beautiful and well-kept home on Lapthorne Avenue in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. It was in that very same home that Byron was slain on November 11, 1988. He was strangled with a towel and then stabbed multiple times. On Byron's wall, the perpetrator had written, I will kill again, raising fears that additional victims were likely to follow. Also, Byron's wallet was missing. There was no evidence of forced entry into the residence. Before Byron was slain, him and the perpetrator were believed to have had consensual intercourse. Byron was gay, but he kept it a secret to spare himself the discrimination that many other people at the time had to face. He had not even disclosed his sexual orientation to his parents, regardless of their close bond. Following his slaying, it was publicly exposed. Authorities would claim decades later that Byron's sexual orientation contributed to the general lack of support and engagement in the case. This was also what Byron's family believed. According to John, Byron's brother, in 2024, people were scared back then for their careers just because they were gay. In 1988, the public perception of being gay wasn't particularly positive. I recall several public officials who were very reluctant about getting involved in the investigation. The slaying of a gay man raised concerns among other LGBTQ residents that they, too, might be targeted by the assailant, and the entire community's response to the incident further fueled their worries that they were unsafe on Prince Edward Island. Speaking to the CBC about Byron and his murder in 2024 was Jeffrey Haight, a former student of Byron's, also gay, who years ago left Prince Edward Island to live in a big city because he feared for his safety. Why was the situation created, he asked. That's because society didn't allow us to be who we truly are. We were also forced to live in the shadows. And when you live in the shadows, you meet certain people you should not be around. After analyzing the most crucial piece of evidence they possessed, the perpetrator's underpants, which had been left behind at the scene, police concluded that he was bisexual. When police removed a portion of the underwear's front to test it for DNA, they discovered both male and female DNA, which was believed to have come from the underwear's wearer and a woman he had sex with. When displayed on a mannequin, the tight-fitting underwear with a 29 and a half inch waist suggested that the perpetrator was of somewhat diminutive frame. Police kept the evidence safe and looked into the case in spite of the public's awkwardness surrounding Byron's sexual orientation and demise. Over the following decades, hundreds of interviews were undertaken. From time to time, police would visit Byron's parents to talk about the investigation, even though there rarely were any significant updates. In October of 2007, Byron's case was officially reopened. Since the LGBTQ community was growing in acceptance, authorities believed that witnesses who might have been reluctant to come forward in 1988 as doing so would have meant revealing their own sexuality would now be open to speak with them. Additionally, 
the Charlottetown Police Service made public a composite photo of a suspect who, just two months after Byron's death, attacked a gay man in Charlottetown and was thought to be connected to the slaying. Up until 2024, the case remained cold. Chief Brad McConnell declared on January 26th that Todd Joseph Gallant, a.k.a. Todd Joseph Irving, 56, had been taken into custody in relation to the death of Byron the previous day and charged with one count of first-degree slaying and one count of tampering with human remains. A second suspect was also detained, but was later freed. Their possible connection to the incident is currently being looked into. For a considerable amount of time, police had been under the impression the perpetrator had returned with at least one other person in order to try and get the evidence implicating him removed from the house. They said in 2013 that two unrelated witnesses had come forward claiming to have spoken with a guy who had confessed to them that the murderer had brought him to Byron's house to dispose of the evidence. The two witnesses came forward in 2008 and 2012, revealing information that was yet to be made public. The person they reported, whose identity has not been made public, had a violent criminal record, had been granted parole just prior to Byron's demise, and had been considered a possible suspect in the case from the beginning of the investigation. But it was too late already to interrogate him about who took him to Byron's house that night, as he had died in the early 2000s. Following Byron's initial strangulation with the towel, the assailant allegedly went back to the house with an accomplice, which is when the investigators believe that Byron was stabbed, the note was written on the wall, and his wallet was stolen. The intent of these acts was to mislead the law enforcement officials. In the dustbin inside Byron's kitchen, socks had been discovered. Police suspected that somebody had worn them on their hands while inside the house to prevent fingerprints from being left behind. One of the socks inside was sampled for DNA, but the sample did not match the DNA on the underwear or the reported accomplice who had passed away. As a result, it's possible that a third person contributed in the efforts to tidy up and tamper with the crime scene following the incident. Gallant was just 21 years old when Byron was slain. Before that, in 1988, he had been residing in Charlottetown, but he later relocated to the U.S. He stayed in Texas and Arkansas before returning to Prince Edward Island in 2022. In 1987, he was detained for breaking and entering in Canada and also had a criminal record in the U.S. His identification had stemmed from genetic genealogy. Charlottetown Police collaborated with Wyndham Forensics Group and Convergence Investigative Genetic Genealogy to identify him as the source of the DNA found at the crime site after familial matches to it were discovered in the family tree DNA and GED match systems. On February 1st, Gallant's attorney, Chris Montigny, appeared in court to represent him. In order to allow Montigny time to go through the considerable amount of evidence and paperwork, the case was postponed until the next month. He is unsure of his client's intended response to the charges brought against him. On the day of Byron's burial, John was told by his mother that it's not really over until we know what happened and why. Both she and Byron's father died a few years before charges in their son's case were filed, and so it was never truly over for them. John, Byron's brother, witnessed Gallant's arrest and was present at the news conference that followed. Regarding the arrest at last, he expressed gratitude to the police for their diligent effort and stated, It feels like a weight is being lifted off you. It's hard to describe. It feels somewhat relieving. Imagine returning home after a long day at work, eager to see your beloved wife. The house is quiet as you step inside, but something feels off. You call out, but there's no response. As you make your way downstairs, a horrifying sight 
stops you in your tracks. This is exactly what happened on the evening of Thursday, June 10, 1971. Raymond Shublin, president of the Lexington Trust Bank, arrived home from his workplace and stumbled upon his wife, Natalie Shublin, a 54-year-old mother of two, deceased in the basement of their Bedford house. With a makeshift gag wrapped around her neck, tying her ankles, her body was lying while face down on the floor. Shublin called the Bedford Police Department right away, and a few minutes later officers showed up. Given the condition of Mrs. Shublin's body, it seemed as if she had died only recently. Following an autopsy, it was discovered that Mrs. Shublin had suffered numerous knife-stab wounds, as well as a severe blunt force injury to her head after being struck by an unknown object. Immediately after, an investigation was launched. It was discovered that Mrs. Shublin's 1969 Chevrolet Impala, which was blue and white, along with a set of bank keys, had been stolen. Authorities searched through the neighborhood, spoke with the residents, and searched for the missing car. Around 8.42 p.m., less than half a mile from the crime scene in the Veterans Administration Hospital parking lot, was where officers eventually found the Impala. Even though it looked like someone had deliberately cleansed the vehicle to get rid of fingerprints, authorities were still able to find and gather a few latent fingerprints from it, one of which was from the right rear window. Numerous possible leads were investigated by the police, but they were unable to determine any person of interest. Utilizing a new technique, the FBI's Automated Fingerprint Identification System, AFIS, fingerprint specialists from the Massachusetts State Police, made an effort to identify the fingerprints on the Impala and additional latent fingerprints taken from the crime site in 1999. This led them to identify Arthur Massey as a possible suspect. Later, two fingerprint specialists from the Massachusetts State Police examined that print and found that the latent print found in the victim's car matches with that of Massey's left thumb. When Massey was questioned by police in 2000, he denied ever having been in Bedford or knowing anything about the slaying. During a reinterrogation with authorities in 2005, Massey gave a different account of what had happened. He claimed that he had turned down a gig from an organized crime associate to kill a banker's wife and stage it as a break-in. In an attempt to find new witnesses, District Attorney Marion Ryan's cold case unit reopened the case in 2019 and gathered background on the defendant. Throughout the course of this extensive investigation, investigators located a woman who confessed to her involvement with Massey in bank fraud schemes from the 1990s. She disclosed that Massey had revealed to her he had affiliations with organized crime and that he had once fatally stabbed someone within their house. This information, together with various other evidence from the case, was submitted to the Middlesex County Grand Jury, who then indicted Massey for first-degree slaying. Prosecutors claim that while Massey was detained on a charge of slaying, he tried to find a witness to provide a fake testimony in the case. Massey addressed a letter to a woman from within the Middlesex Sheriff's Office in Billerica, asking her to find a witness who would testify that he had been framed for a made-up story. An alleged $1,000 was promised for the testimony by the perpetrator. As per the announcement, Massey's letters contained escalating threats, such as that he would send somebody to harm her, and that he would get to the woman like a bullet. Furthermore, according to the prosecution, Massey instructed others outside the jail to collect debts incurred through illegal loan sharking. Investigators and the Middlesex Sheriff's Office worked together to expose this scheme, and in the trial of a capital indictment, prosecutors added a charge of soliciting to suborn perjury. This charge was added to the indictment charging first-degree slaying and was set for the trial. In March 2022, 78 years old, Arthur Massey was taken into custody. On Tuesday, May 14th, 2024, 
nearly half a century after Natalie Schublin had passed away. A jury found him guilty of first-degree murder in connection with her demise, in addition to a separate charge relating to an attempt to bribe a witness to provide false testimony in his favor. The prosecution cited Massey's lengthy history of criminal convictions and prison terms, including his assault on correctional officers, twice escape convictions, and a 2016 conviction for disobeying court orders pertaining to harassment and abuse. Natalie Schublin was a wife and a mother. She had survived cancer and had hobbies like gardening and painting. Middlesex District Attorney Ryan pointed out that this woman was viciously slain inside her own house by an intruder. Her case remained unresolved for over five decades. According to District Attorney Ryan, the verdict rendered today is the result of years of investigative work representing the core objective of the Cold Case Unit, which is to provide closure to families. Sadly, Raymond Schublin wasn't able to see his wife's case's resolution. Following a brief period of sickness, he passed away on December 30th, 2011, in Maine. He was 92 years old at the time. Raymond and Natalie had left behind two children, Carol Bartlett and Kenneth Schublin, who are still alive. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of cold cases.